When I first started researching mathematical physics, I was astounded to realize that the physicists themselves openly admit that they have absolutely no explanations for even the most basic of physical phenomena. <clears throat> Why is it that when I release this pencil, it is pulled to the earth? Why is it that this magnet pulls this paper clip to it? Not even the top physicists can tell you. Here's Richard Feynman in his own words. And there it has to do with the fact that in iron, all the electrons are spinning in the same direction. They all get lined up and they magnify the effect of the force until it's large enough at a distance that you can feel it. Hey, what is this, Rich? Star Wars? In physics, in reality, there's no such thing as a force. For the purposes of physics, to force is a verb. It is what something does, not what something is. But it's a force which is present all the time and very common and is in a basic force of almost. I mean, I can go a little further back if I were more technical. But at an early level, I just have to, have to tell you that's going to be one of the things you'll just have to take as an element in the world, the existence of magnetic repulsion or electrical, or electrical attraction, magnetic attraction. Yes, we already understand that electric and magnetic repulsion and attraction occur. We know that it happens. But the question here, Rich, is what physical object mediates the attraction? I can't explain that attraction in terms of anything else that's familiar to you. For example, if we say the magnets attract like as if they were connected by rubber bands, I would be cheating you. Because they're not connected by rubber bands, I shouldn't be in trouble. See, that's what I'm looking for, Rich. An actual, rational explanation that I can visualize, that you can visualize, that can be illustrated. If two objects were being pulled together by rubber bands, then at least we can understand how they're being pulled together. At least we know that there is an object mediating the effect. In your explanation, or your non-explanation, you claim that a force is what causes effects. Basically stating, an effect effects. A verb performs a verb. Not making much sense to me, Rich. You soon asked me about the nature of the band. And secondly, if you were curious enough, you'd ask me why rubber bands tend to pull back together again, and I would end up explaining that in terms of electrical forces, which are the very things that I'm trying to use the rubber bands to explain, so I have cheated very badly, you see. Cheated very badly? That's a pretty accurate way to put it. You don't even know how the atoms of a rubber band stick together. And who can blame you? I mean, the Bohr's planetary model is still what people use, and that's been debunked for decades. So it's no wonder you can't explain how two magnets stick to each other. Hmm. So I'm not going to be able to give you an answer to why magnets attract each other, except to tell you that they do. And to tell you that that's one of the elements in the world of different kinds of forces. There are electrical forces, magnetic forces, gravitational forces, and others. And those are some of the parts. If you were a student, you'd go fur I could go further. I could tell you that the magnetic forces are related to the electrical forces very intimately. That our relationship between the gravity forces and electrical forces remains unknown. And so on. But I really can't do a good job, any job of explaining magnetic force in terms of something else that you're more familiar with because I don't understand it in terms of anything else that you're more familiar with. Looks to me like you don't understand it at all, Rich. But you're not the only one, so we're not going to pick on you alone. Let's go on to uh, some other well-known uh, physicists out in the field. Here is an interview questioning Michio Kaku and Lawrence Krauss 
and a few others on uh, what a black hole is made of. Are black holes made of anything? Made of anything? <laughs> black hole hmm. we don't really have any idea what's going on so why can't they tell you what a black hole is well it's because it's not anything like the mainstream conception of a black hole most people believe that a black hole is made of matter that has been condensed and left over after a giant star has collapsed but the scholars know that a black hole is not hypothesized to be made of anything at all. A black hole is comprised of two concepts. A zero-dimensional singularity at the center, a point, as though you're pointing at a certain spot on the wall. It's just a concept. There's nothing there. It's just a, a location. Surrounded by another location called the event horizon. Both of these locations are not given any physical architecture whatsoever. And what about that old debunked version of the atom I mentioned earlier? When we first learn of the atom, we are likely to be taught about the Bohr model. We picture solid objects orbiting around a collection of solid spheres. Perhaps we imagine planets orbiting a star, as with our solar system. No wonder science is so difficult to understand for so many people because it's not understandable. This Bohr's planetary model is completely irrational. They haven't explained or illustrated what physical object extends from the proton to the electron holding it in place. As a matter of fact, they have no explanation of any physical mediator that extends from even the Earth to the Sun to hold the Earth from flying away from the Sun. They can't explain this to you because they don't have a clue. Later we are taught that these things are not solid objects moving in a Newtonian world, but they have properties of waves. They have properties of waves? Last time I checked, wave is what something does. A flag can wave. Water can wave. What object is waving in the case of electromagnetism? Is it a little bead traveling in a wavy path? What physical object waves? Then, if we persevere, we may learn of the double slit experiment. And these things, such as electrons, are neither particles nor waves. They may display properties of both, but they are neither. Our intuition fails at this point, as does our language. The best we can do, so far as language is concerned, is to fall back upon the familiar wave-particle duality, collapse of the wave function. It might be familiar to a bobblehead like you, who has studied and read up on these things and memorized all of these terms, but to a layman and a critical thinker like myself, hearing wave-particle duality is utter nonsense, especially after you've already established that it is neither a wave nor a particle. If it's neither of them, then how can you describe it as a mix between the two? We've already established that it can't be a particle because there's no source for pull between the two. And we've already established that it can't be a wave because there's no such thing as a wave. A wave is what something does. Wave is a verb. But this language does little to help our understanding. Yeah, you can say that again. But this language does little to help our understanding. And it gets more complicated still when we discover that protons and neutrons at the center of an atom are made up of quarks, and a variety of quarks to boot. Oh? And what exactly is this object, which is supposed to hold the quarks together? And what is this membrane-like object holding the three little quark balls together? And most fundamentally, what is this, surrounding the quark and giving it shape? This medium 
is, of course, space. All objects require a background to give it a shape. Without a background, you have no shape. The universal, boundless background is, of course, nothing. In other words, empty space. But even this fact is mystically ignored by the math magicians of modern physics. But we can't stop at quarks. It's far more obtruse than that. What you are seeing here is a computer simulation of, well, I'll let Lawrence Krauss explain. This is the space inside of a proton, the empty space inside of a proton. Not where the quarks are, but the empty space between the quarks. And these propagations, or fields, are not insignificant. Most of the mass of the proton comes not from the quarks within a proton, but from the empty space between the quarks. These fields popping in and out of existence produce about 90% of the mass of a proton. And since protons and neutrons are the dominant stuff in your body, the empty space is responsible for 90% of your mass. So what medium is providing shape to the object we could see on screen here, Krauss? What surrounds and contours the empty space that you are showing in this diagram? What allows for the shape and motion of this object? Is that really nothing? No, to say that empty space is not empty is a patently ridiculous self-contradiction that can only be overlooked by the most brainwashed of scholars. The reason why these simple conceptual issues are so hard to grasp for these people is because they're trapped in mathematics. There is one language that comes closer than any other to describing these things, the universal language of mathematics. Although, whilst it is universal, it is not universally understood. One plus one equals five. And that's because mathematics is not universal. Whatever universal is supposed to mean, math is actually a tautological system of logic based on assumed axioms. There is not a universal starting place for these assumed axioms, and all, quote, truth derived from such axioms is based only on such subjective assumptions. Anybody can use logic to, quote, prove anything wrong. It's what some would call rhetoric. Math can only be used as quantitative adverbs. They cannot explain how objects behave in the ways that they do. Math can tell you that 1,000 minus 1,000 equals zero, but it can't tell you why you lost $1,000 from your bank account. But when you get right down to it, even the math fails. Here's uh, Michio telling you that in order to solve the equation of um, a, a black hole, you have to divide by zero. It's, it's hilarious and astounding. Inside these equations, there's a monster. In the extreme gravity at the core of a black hole, Einstein's equations spiral wildly out of control. After a very long, tedious calculation, I mostly get zeros, but the non-zero term is given as follows. M is the mass of the black hole. R describes the distance from the black hole. Here is the problem, right there. When r is equal to zero, the point at which physics itself breaks down. Oh, so because you can't figure it out, physics breaks down? Good one, Michio. So one over r equals one over zero equals infinity. To a mathematician, infinity is simply a number without limit. To a physicist, it's a monstrosity. It means that, first of all, gravity is infinite at the center of a black hole, that time stops, and what does that mean? Space makes no sense. It means the collapse of everything we know about the physical universe. In the real world, there's no such thing as infinity. Therefore, there is a fundamental flaw in the formulation of Einstein's theory. So the question naturally arises. 
why do physicists use debunked theories? If black holes, the particle atom, non-empty space, and other such absurd theories are irrational, then what the hell are we paying these people for? Wake up. These scientists are just as bureaucratic as any other government agency, and they want to control your thoughts on reality, because that's the only way that you'll see them as legitimate. That's the only way that you will continue to look up to them and pay them money and buy their books. Thanks for watching, everybody. I hope that this has uh, helped you to understand some of the problems of modern physics.